Um, okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much for, for joining us from across campus. Thanks uh, especially to our special guest today, Professor Jane Chin Davidson, who is joining us from the art department. Um, Jane Chin Davidson is an art historian, curator, whose research focuses on transnationalism in relation to Chinese identity, feminism, ecofeminism, performance, performativity, and global exhibitions of contemporary art. Her recent publications including the, uh, include the brand new Companion to Contemporary Art in a Global Framework from Wiley Blackwell, uh, co-edited with Amelia Jones. Um, and what I think we're going to hear a little bit about today and is on your screen there, Staging Art and Chineseness, Politics of Transnationalism and Global Expositions from the University of Manchester Press uh, just a couple years ago. Um, and several other uh, co-edited volumes and many, many articles contributing to her field and enriching uh, the bridge, I think, between Chinese studies, art history, and art criticism, much, much more. Professor Chin Davidson was awarded top honors with a distinguished PhD postgraduate at the University of Manchester, a British ESRC fellowship at the Cultural Theory Institute, and a Getty Research Institute postgraduate fellowship. In addition to her monographs, edited books, and peer-reviewed journals, such as the Case Studies in the Environment 2022, she contributes to hyper, uh, hyper allergic, and I'll share the link, um, and much more in art criticism. I'm going to share in the chat after Professor Chin Davidson's initial remarks, links to her faculty profile and to this recent book. Those who are gathered here are going to be lucky. A few of you are going to be walking away with uh, Professor, Professor Chin Davidson's uh, a very exciting monograph um, that I've been enjoying myself. Uh, and I did ask our guest of honor if she'd be willing to sign your copy, and she is happy to oblige. Uh, so please join me in giving uh, Professor Chin Davidson a warm welcome. Thank you, Dr. Marie. Thank you for inviting me to participate in your Modern China Lecture Series. Um, I'm so appreciative of this opportunity to talk to my own people because I'm normally not speaking to Cal State. I mean, I speak all over the world, but not normally at CSUSB for some weird reason. Um, and um, I'm so looking forward to sharing a conversation, which is what we built this event to be like. But um, I wanted to take some time to introduce my work, my research on Chinese contemporary art, and as Dr. Murray says, um, my book, Staging Art and Chineseness, Politics of Transnationalism and Global Exhibitions, um, was just released in paperback in 2022, um, grapples with the fact that Chinese artists, especially women artists, um, in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the United States, elsewhere in diaspora, represent identities that very much diverge from the People's Republic of China. And so my book questions how to navigate and contextualize transnational narratives and subjects by artists. Can you go to the next slide, please. Like Yaking Tan from Australia, who's, who's um, still here from uh, her video work called Scavenger, um, was developed uh, for Hong Kong, but she's an Australian Chinese uh, artist, and also Chinese American artist, Patty Chang on the upper right-hand corner, whose minor video called Minor was developed in the Turkic, Turkic Uyghur region of Xinjiang on the border of China. Or Wu Ma Li, who is here on the bottom right, uh, a performative project called Plum Tree Creek, uh, was presented in the countryside of Taiwan. These are all diverse Chinese locations. And in this way, my study is, is centered on the politics of borders, of um, nationalisms, as they re, uh, relate to Chinese contemporary. And so um, my question begins with what does the term Chinese art mean in the 21st century? Now that globalization is online, digital um, dig digital identities are a part of our, you know, avatar formation affecting all visual culture and all visual representations. Can we define cultural identity today from the vantage point of contemporary art? 
Next slide, please. Um, Chinese aesthetics in the Western imaginary is still decorative. Silk scrolls, terracotta warriors, oriental artworks, blockbuster exhibitions of a thousand, two thousand years of Chinese art. Um, the epitome is, of course, the imperial Ming vase. And those in the Percival David collection in the British Museum here um, were found in the court of the last emperor of the Qing dynasty. Uh, but this collection is named after the collector, not the Qing emperor. Sir David, Percival David is the celebrated figure who acquired the imperial works in 1927 after the fall of the last dynasty. Why should we know art by the collector? He was a baronet, an aristocrat, an honorary advisor to the National Palace in Beijing in 1928 before the onset of Japanese um, invasion in Manchuria in 1931. And in the British Museum, you can see uh, the representation of the imperial status of the collection is supported by this really beautiful space in uh, the British Museum, lending authority to an institution that actually recently has come under great fire for its colonialist and imperialist legacy. Um, next slide, please. Ever since China's experimental artists in the 1980s showcased the country's transformation after Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms, the emergence of Chinese China's Deng Dai Yishu has become a phenomenon in the 21st century. It refers to the profitable production of Chinese art represented in museums and auction houses all over the world. And then there are contemporary artists like Ai Weiwei who responded to China's political changes by dropping a Han Dynasty urn dating to 200 BC before Common Era in a performance which he photographed in 1995. At the time when, that he did this work, um, a Ming vase or Qing dynasty vase like this in 2010 sold for a record breaking $69.5 million from the collector who acquired it in the 1930s. Um, this particular Qing dynasty vase, though, was thought to be among the treasures looted by the British troops when they sacked the imperial palaces in Beijing during the Second Opium War in 1856, and the collector who sold it acquired it in 1930, which reminds us that collecting is a form of conquest itself. And collected artifacts are material signs of victory over their former owners, which has been the subtext of the British Museum and other anthropology museums in the 19th century, functioning as collectors of the whole entire world. And I had co-edited a book um, that really discusses this phenomenon um, with uh, my colleagues at the UCLA Fowler Museum in 2018, addressing the difference between contemporary art and anthropological representation in my Rutledge title, Global Art and World Art in the Practice of the University Museum. The other part of staging art in Chineseness addresses the way in which museum and industrial complexes have defined Chinese culture via the politics of transnationalism and global exhibitions. Um, go to the next. Let me, well, let's go back to this slide here. What do you think, what do you think he's doing? Does anyone have any thoughts looking at this? Why did he drop this vase that's purportedly 200 before Common Era? I mean, what's the point of destroying this old historical object? Does anyone have a thought here? Perhaps yeah. it's your line in the second paragraph, when you say the collecting is a form of conquest and collected artifacts. Yeah. So this guy is trying to, to break. He's trying to this break, idea. yes. Trying to, trying to break this imperialist yeah. and colonialist legacy. It's very expensive by the way, but. Yeah, he's saying, what's the value of this? when it belongs to the British Museum and yeah. not China, right? Do you, can you kind of see where he's going? 
Yes, he's really done something extraordinary in 1995, right around the time when China's art emerged on the global stage. Thank you, brilliant. Your next, please. Next slide, please. And Patty Chang here in minor presents a whole different other <clears throat> representation. Complex problems with artistic representation can be reconceptualized through performance, um, which my research focuses primarily on because of um, the way in which embodied forms of representation can sh showcase identity. Um, not only among cultural differences in Hong Kong and China and Taiwan, but also in the border regions of like uh, minors, Uyghur peoples. Um, they, uh, Kevin Chang, who's um, from Los Angeles, uh, took this work, did this work on the in Xinjiang. Um, spending the day with her new friends at the cotton factory in the agricultural region, um, Chang's 2010 video performance puts into question the ethnicity of being Chinese. She asked me to try to cover their um, identities. I'm not doing very good. But um, she's very worried about uh, exposing these young women. Um, one is a Ouija constituent. The other is Han Chinese. The Muslim community continues to endure China's comprehensive campaign to indoctrinate people into the Communist Party by advocating their change from agrarian to factory lifestyles. It's all about industrial revolution. Under heavy surveillance, about a million Ouija people since 2017 have been sent to re-education camps um, while entire neighborhoods are bulldozed and transformed by the Chinese government. Minor's reflection of transnational Chinese at the border of China, Patty Chang disrupts the assumption that the foreigner is, as described by Etienne Balbar, is among those other humans, precisely strangers, already belonging to other spaces. So you can see that she's really examining this notion of identity on the borders of China. Next slide, please. The work of Wang Hui Chong, the um, Chinese artist from Malaysia, verifies the Muslim history of China. 2005 installation, Minaret, consists of a lighted bamboo and netting tower built as a temporary structure on the roof of the Guangdong Art Museum, presented at the second Guangzhou triennial, described by Ho Han Lu as an expression still related to migration, history, and religion, more related to globalization, having this long history in China as it's something that is not new at all. The scaffolded minaret tower hails from a tradition of Islamic mosques. Um, and while Wang was inspired when he discovered that the oldest mosque in China was in Guangzhou, he also viewed the symbol as a marker of a thousand years of globalization. The artist had initially approached the imam at the still functioning Huaisheng Mosque to complete the project there at the original mosque site, but in the end, his structure would be placed at the museum to show this green light visible for miles around. Next slide, please, Jeremy. Um, the complexity of cultural Chinese difference occupies the larger scope of my book. It's very personal to me. I use the term Chineseness to problematize the notions of no nationalism and identity. And actually, here is my immigration photograph from my naturalization papers when I immigrated from Hong Kong to the United States. As a child, I knew the vast differences among diverse Chinese cultural contexts. But growing up, I had always felt the Orientalist stereotypes that constantly overshadowed any understanding of Chinese subjecthood. As such, Chineseness refers to cultural paradoxes. If indeed we can be honest about colonialist ideologies that still affect Chinese identities in the United States and in Europe, 
I pose it as a question for discussing what exactly is authentic artistic representation and what is the colonialist structure behind globalized exhibitions of contemporary art. The discourse on Chineseness engages in these concepts developed more broadly in the 1990s in film theory by theorists like Ray Chow or Sheldon Shalvet Pang Lu, who used Louis Althusser's concept of interpolation to understand how we know ourselves as Chinese subjects through identifying with film. And I adapted this for performance and for video, the fact that Althusser had based his notion of interpolation on Mao Zedong's 1937 essay on contradiction was important to my thesis in understanding Althusser, Marxism, and interpolation in the film. So my argument for this book returns to Althusser's formative concept that contradiction is inseparable from the total structures of the social world. No longer is the anti-bourgeois, anti-capitalist campaign in China, the actions of the Communist Party, the stakes have been raised by the current cycle of multinational petrocapitalism and anthropocentric distinction that are inseparable from the earlier industrial model. And the current industrialization in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, inextricably linked from profound impact on the acceleration of climate change and environmental crisis. Excuse me. Go ahead, next Excuse slide. Me. Just a, a very good question. What did you say about Louis Althusser, the, uh, his expression? About Althusser. Yeah, when you, when you talk about uh, Louis Althusser, yeah. can you repeat that? Mm -hmm. I didn't catch that. Uh, um, what expression. I think was I, that Althusser um, took his thesis from Mao Zedong's on contradiction. So it's really a globalized theory if you think about how Althusser, the great Louis Althusser, is really using Mao Zedong's writings in his creation of interpolation. And um, I think that I could spend this rest of the time talking about interpolation, but it's really about, um, in a nutshell, it's about how film, when we watch film, we identify with the subjects on film, and therefore we're interpolated. We see ourselves as knowing ourselves as Chinese people, for instance, through film, and how film relates to um, uh, your own seeing yourself in the world. Thank you. May, may you uh, go back to the past, the last slide? Uh, can you unpack the definition of the Chinese-ness since 1992? <laughs> what do you mean by appropriation of Chinese culture based on the lack of self representation Yeah, if you can go back here, um, I actually Ray Chow, that's her concept of Chinese-ness. And she had been writing in 1998 on Chinese-ness as a theoretical problem, whereupon she suggests that um, Chinese-ness indicates this Orientalism that Edward Said had create had established for for a, a world in which Chinese subjects could be Arab subjects could be any subject under the Occident Orientalist model, and so um, her writing about it, which I encourage you to read, um, Chinese as a theoretical problem, suggests that all Chinese culture in the 1990s is a product of Orientalism. And that she used that term to suggest that there is no authentic Chinese models in um, theoretical discussion in, in the United States as a, a film theorist. She's a film theorist. But now, uh, Mei Ling Chang, who is my colleague at USC, she writes that Chineseness is now transformed, that it's an ambiguous, fluid, and deterritorialized concept. In, in that there is no such thing as authenticity. And that Orientalism has to be a part of the vocabulary of the Chinese subject, um, which is what happens in globalization, right? And that um, the old earlier anti-Orientalist um, model is still there. You still have the stereotypes, but they've become a part of culture. And um, I, I think you, you kind of get it, right? I mean, can someone put it in a different way? How 
um, Orientalism is part of culture. It's no longer like a, a stereotype that we don't know anymore. Anyway, so um, those two books, I encourage you to read them and take a look at them. Um, they, they really feel my discussion in this book um, because I'm trying to get at uh, a globalized concept for the 21st century, the way in which artists have taken, them, taken on um, the theoretical foundation for identity. So um, here, my chapter, Environment, labor, and video epifeminist interpolations, I still use the term interpolation, um, has been the research direction that I've moved towards ever since publishing this book. And my focus on environmental crises has grown. Um, I tend to be asked to speak about this more than anything these days. Um, the context of labor underscores the issues, though, that are important feminist subjects they are matriarchal subjects, I argue. Um, here, again, is Australian um, artist Yakin Tan depicting these issues in visually arresting ways through video works that focus on the city of Hong Kong. Her 2012 Limits of Visibility captures the volume landscape of recycling materials that are always found on the harbor of Hong Kong. Um, Tan, Tan transports the viewer to the cargo area where tons of paper is compacted into modular cubes. And these get shipped out on long barges to another colony where they're picked over. Um, the need to understand the most basic human responsibility in the global cycle of mass consumption provokes a rudimentary return to the foundation of historical Marx, I argue. Um, Jean-Luc Nancy um, explains the position with simplicity. Human life becomes dependent upon products when it's thought of as production away from the unproductive or life in tune with the cosmos, with existence. So, in other words, interpolation here is really about a video screen that's larger in life. If you think of this in a museum, you're sitting, you're standing in front of garbage, right? I, I wanted to use this as a cover for my book, but my editor said, no, you cannot put garbage on the cover of your book. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. But, you know, what she's trying to say is if you're standing in front of this as an, as an aesthetic object, what does that do to you? No. Picture yourself in a museum and you've got a huge screen like museum shows and installations in there. You're standing in front of this um, video screen of 20 minute loop of looking and facing garbage. Does that do anything to you? I'm, I'm asking you to envision what that would be like for you standing in front of this huge amount of garbage. Does it do anything to you? Does it? Yeah. It, it just makes you stop and see what you throw away every day, right? Um, at least it did for me. And in my book, I, I take it on from um, the position of labor. Go to the next slide. Because Yuking Tan um, did a lot of performance installations where, in this case, Here's uh, Lam Po Po. She um, is uh, a, a daily worker who brings cardboard to the recycling center. That's her day, day job. And usually she just goes around to all the businesses in Hong Kong, stacks up the cardboard and takes it to the recycling center. And what Yaking Tan did as an artist, she laser cutted a lion out of a huge stack of cardboard. So in, in essence, Lam Po Po is pushing a cardboard lion to the recycling center. And in the end, it goes to the, it, to the recycling center and gets dismantled. Right? Um, it's a really beautiful message because on the one hand, she modeled the lion after the HSBC bank lion that's been there. It's a colonial um, symbol for ages. <laughs> Um, talking about how the cycle of, of industrial um, you know, commodification is really 
uh, a, a profit-making industrial capitalist venture. Um, and then she asks you, what is the value of a cardboard lion in relation to a bronze statue? What is the difference, right? And she's really pushing us to think about her labor as a rag picker, a bottle picker, a cardboard picker, that's her daily life is picking up cardboard. Right? And, and in this instance, she creates a different sensibility for this work that she does, doesn't she? I mean, she's suddenly a, uh, a lion for, she, you know, she's pushing a lion statue, not a stack of cardboard. Mm -hmm. um, the Buddha's teaching, which I wrote about in the book, refers to the Dharma of material based on Emperor Wu's um, concept that gold can tell you something about the concept of emptiness. And that is a Buddhist sutra questioning why we think gold is so valuable. Why isn't cardboard valuable? You know, and in the spectrum of life, how do we make value? And what does art really do for us? Okay, so um, I'm coming to the end of my little talk, and we can come back to any of these you want to talk about. Um, next slide, please, Jeremy. Um, and Taiwanese artist Wu Ma Li provides a whole different perspective because her artwork is a performative project uh, whereby she's gone to this creek called Plum Tree Creek that since 2006 was a huge industrial mess. And so in her performance piece, she brings the whole community get together to clean up this, this um, really devastated creek from industrial waste from um, 2006 to about 2010, they cleaned up the creek and then they started, they started making gardens and they developed a whole different sensibility for this place um, after Chiang Kai-shek uh, escaped from the nationalists in Taiwan in 1949, his surrender to Mao. Um, the growth of industrial activities, commercial development emerged huge, a new in transnational capitalism in partnership with the United States. And at the time, China as a national entity through the Republic of Taiwan was the uh, relationship that the United States had. And by the 1990s, Made in Taiwan was replaced by Made in China. So you can see the cycle of industrial transformation, industrial for-profit capitalism that's now taken over by China. And what was left, according to Wu Mali, was the devastation of industrial waste in her, her village, her, her town. And so this is her performance art piece, was to bring people together, go to the next slide. Um, and what happened was that suddenly the, the, the whole community came alive, enjoyed being with each other, learned about each other, and started eating. Of course, Chinese people love to eat. You know, you got to eat. So cooking food, and it became a whole amazing community project, but it is actually an art installation. So these are performance works that I've been very, very interested in and writing about ever since. Um, how a person treats the river and the environment is the strategy that Wu Mali is trying to assert for her community. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and here's Patty Chang. Patty Chang's Invocation for a Wandering Lake, 2015. Um, her performance is connecting bodies of humans to bodies of water. Move away from the ideology of empire, consigning art to neither nation nor cultural production, but really her environmental works align with the ideals for a world ecology. Jason Moore's argument that humans are a part of nature, the whole nature makes us is really uh, what she's trying to, to prove. Um, here she's 
uh, found this up at uh, Newfoundland. She found this dead whale in the water and it really made her very sad. Um, she decided to do a ritual cleansing for the fish and she set out to um, do this invocation for the wandering lake. She captures the meditation by cleaning the dead whale um, that's beached on the shore of the Canadian province. Um, it's a work of mourning because by the 1970s, small fishing villages up there in Newfoundland were abandoned after industrial fishing destroyed the balance of the natural seasons there. And so her, her whole point was to, to show that the devastation of the community without fishing was, you know, symbolized by the death of this fish. You can go to the next slide, please. And um, this work has really taken off um, and people all over the world have been looking at this work. Um, last year I was in um, Abu Dhabi at NYU Abu Dhabi because that piece was shown in um, you know, uh, a, that community. Um, the uh, Chang's artistic production raises the specter of of a time gone past, Althusser's theorization of the past images of consciousness suggests that the greater impact of capitalist structures is reproduced through echoes, phantoms of history, what it has become, anticipations, allusions to itself in global capitalism. The past is always with us, no matter how we distract ourselves from it. And according to the eco-feminist artist, what is at stake is the real detriment of global capitalism is that environmental demise of the planet. And um, finally, Jeremy, my last um, slide uh, is focuses on Chao Fei for Haze and Fog in 2013, um, portrays the doomsday scenario. Um, in 2013, um, the city dweller in the modern environment of Beijing um, is really about the air apocalypse at that time of haze and fog. Um, the term emerged in January 2013 when Beijing's bad air quality toppled the American EPA scale of 755, well above the 500 maximum. And so people had to stay indoors because of the air pollution alerts. And out of that, she decided to create this 40-minute film called Haze and Fog, where um, everyone is aligned by pollution. The zombie folklore, um, everyone shares the same zombie dead space. The egalitarian element of pollution creates an entirely new zombie class of the dead in the wake of global warming and this new dialectical materialism of environmental conditions. Um, so aligning with the Anthropocene, the zombie class appears more and more like the human class completely separated from nature. And unlike the Capitalocene's ideals for connecting humans with nature, the Anthropocene perceives that all humans are implicated in the destruction of nature. The real problem is that solutions emerging by the scientists of the Anthropocene tend to be emanating from the same carbon industrial capitalist ideals. And so the Capitalocene's advocacy is the opposite. Unless we start to see ourselves again as entities of nature, we're all doomed to become one, one particular cultural identity and that's the zombie identity of the walking dead. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm happy to have a conversation with you about any of this or anything not. Thank you so much, Professor Chin Davidson. That was really that, that was really exciting and um gave us a lot to think about. It's a lot, and I rushed through it because no, I, I, I spend a whole lot of time on my stuff. I wanted to hear what you guys. I, I love the, the 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 treatment of a few of the, the key things in the book, and I We'll have a couple of books uh, to give away at the end. I have Yawin has her copy already, and a couple of uh, copies have gone out. Um, but um, we'll do that at the at the end of the session. We have a little while uh, still to 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 discuss this and to to talk a little bit more about this. I know my students. We've been talking about Chinese history for fifteen weeks, going back to the 
I Ching period all the way up to the present. So please bring your questions. I know it looks like we've got one in the chat, question or comment. Um, Kathleen said you talked you uh, uh, talked lightly about environmentalism and its connection to feminist issues like the scars, scarves you have shown. Could you explain this further? My knee-jerk reaction is to make a connection to Mother Earth, but I'm not sure if that is a more Western concept. Thank you for coming to speak with us, Professor Chin Davis. No, you're exactly right. It is about the Mother Earth. And for a long time, feminists thought of it as essentialist to say that, well, women and nature are one. And um, now we're like reverting to say, no, everyone's nature. You know, it's not just women and nature. It's human beings are nature. We are biological, nat natural beings. And unless we start to see ourselves again in that um, in that identity of a nature identity. Um, we really can't get very far in our environmental um, uh, advocacy or change to our mindset about consumption or um, you know, moving away from commodification and actually understanding our role as human beings as being aligned with plants animals and all of nature, even you know, lakes and water, fish. I mean, the, all these artists have that in common and the reproductive value that women know intently is really the reproductive value that um, these artists are really trying to showcase because um, it is a feminist issue of realigning with nature and not to be ashamed of it, right? Not to say that that's a bad thing, that it's this essentialist thing, that men are also nature too, it's not just women. You're a part of the reproductive, um, you know, cycle. <laughs> Can't do it without you. Can't really do it without you. <laughs> it's a, no, no, no way. I want to ask a little bit about Chineseness also because it's in the title and, and I've just started the book and I'm really excited about this and I sent you a note about how we we modern historians often are very um we challenge this sort of authenticity idea as you mentioned from Ray Chow and others and so so modern historians we like that we talk about peeling the onion and then whether there is a bear there Benedict Anderson and magic communities um and I, I'm interested in this because I think questions of nationalism and race are very context specific so that if you're in the United States or if you're in Hong Kong or if you're in Taiwan, Chineseness is going to mean something very different Absolutely. than, say, for example, what, what Xi Jinping will, will want to project as a certain as sort of having the mandate of Chineseness and a sort of cultural confidence. Um, so I, I think my, my sense is that is that you're opening a conversation mm -hmm. um, about Chineseness and challenging uh, our ideas of saying what Chineseness is. Is it holding a Chinese passport? Well, is it is it PRC or is it Taiwanese? Or what? And then, or, or does it mean a, a, a heritage or ethnic or racial identity? Um, and I really appreciated that. And I was wondering if, the, if there's anything you wanted to sort of follow up about in terms of Chineseness or maybe the Sinophone world and. Yeah. Um, and, and talk a little bit more about, about this exploration. Well, I mean, just recently I was approached to translate my book into Russian because of the Sino-Asian context. I mean, those borders are really, really close. Um, and, and so this book has opened up that conversation to ask what is Chinese culture today? And can we come to a, uh, a clearer understanding of Yes, there's legacies, there's tradition, there's uh, deep, deep uh, cultural representations of China. When you're in China, you have a whole different set of values or set of ideals for culture. You have a whole different set of traditions. From my experience growing up in, in Hong Kong and coming to the United States with my family living in Hong Kong, very different, very, very different. And so, um, the, the 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 point of Chineseness is to really just ask for a different dialogue than the old one, where we see the whole world as either Occident or Orient, and that we are none of that. We're all very specific. We have 
different experiences, all of us. And can we come together and embrace that, you know, as Chinese people in China? Um, and so it, it's really interesting what this book has done, because when I first wrote it back, or when I first part, you know, did the research for my um, dissertation, people were really against it, you know, this notion of Chineseness. They said, well, that's Orientalism. And I said, yes, it is. Yes, it is. But how do we get past that to think about the diversity of culture that is Chinese culture? How do we get past this notion that um, the decorative rugs that people always thought were Chinese cultures, cultural production, how do we get past that to say, yeah, that has a role now in what we see as cultural production? You know, it's, it's just, I, I know I'm watering it down to some certain degree, but those borders, that nationalism does nobody any good. That's, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. But I love that, I, I think maybe, and, and us being here at Cal State San Bernardino is, is something to celebrate in a sense because of, 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 what, of where we are in the world, because yeah. of the students we work with, because of the situation we're in, there is maybe, whereas, because I have friends and colleagues at neighboring schools who, who are, are all about sort of complete demolition of nations, cultures, everything like that. And I say, well, there is also, and, and I celebrate that and we talk about it in class and we, we, we do that sort of freewheeling demolition, burn it all down, you know, <laughs> it's all creation. And, and, but then there's also the, the issue of subjectivity yeah. as opposed to simple objectivity, right? So we, we recognize the, the, the objectivity of being assigned cultural uh, and ethnic and racial labels and the oppression that goes into that historically, but also not to neglect, and especially this protest going on now that are Absolutely. reminiscent of the 1960s, Absolutely. when in, in Chicanismo and, and in, in, in Black Power movements, there was such an importance in terms of the subjectivity of cultural and even national identities, so that there's a danger, I think, in some institutions, but not Cal State San Bernardino, of outrunning reality. Yes, uh, and, and and understanding the urgency of, of cultural construction, um, awesome. right? and and I think that comes through here. I really, Great. really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, I, you totally got it. It is, it is about celebrating something instead of looking at it going the other way, right? It's always um, oh, that's Orientalist. Oh, that's Occidentalist. You know, I mean, when do we just put it down and say? culture is alive, it's a living, breathing thing. And so when I um, look at performance, that's really the reason why. It's like artists using performance expect you to have an experience. They don't expect you to come away with an object. They want you to have an experience and embrace that experience, you know, um, which is why I, I, performance to me is really the way to go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you because it's really interesting. Uh, I would like to ask you, and I, not not to ask you to to come in with you. This is not a, this is not an exam, right? <laughs> when you talk about the ecofeminist warning, is clear, and you are using some references, some French references, uh, Louis Althusser, for example. Yeah. Why instead uh, when you used to Simone de Beauvoir, instead Louis Althusser, uh, by by one side, by the other side. Uh, it's very interesting your idea about borders, <laughs> because at the end, this is a, if, if we talk about uh, geographies, if we talk about or sexuality, if we talk about the political or economical issues, we are talking always about borders. They are. They are. So uh, it, it, it is really interesting to, how to, you, to involve different aspects with no borders. Well, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of us are talking about trans as a transnationalist, transcultural, transliteration, translation, using that as the model. Um, I'm actually working right now with a whole group of, of uh, scholars in Europe looking at transculturalism and transnationalism as a way forward to rethink nationalisms um, because we live in such terrible times, right? I mean, nationalism is really why we're in trouble. 
um, in the Middle East for sure. Um, and so uh, the, the vocabulary has to change. It is about how you view yourself in the world. And if, you, if indeed we take on the trans model where even gender is fluid, you know, yeah. if indeed we can be fluid in the way we see ourselves as identities, um, we, have, we stand a chance because then we can see the other person as in the same space as you. And um, I love Simone de Beauvoir. Um, I think she's fantastic. Um, I, I think that uh, if you were to look at Althusser's work, his model was Simone de Beauvoir. I'm just going down the historical trajectory where, uh, where Althusser actually was informed by the, uh, the, the group of, of uh, thinkers that actually ended up being Foucault was his his uh, student, um, but uh, in in the end, Althusser was was somebody I was very interested in because of his reading of Mao, and I wanted to make that case that Mao Zedong is the work of uh, Mao Zedong's work is in the work of Althusser, and you never get that anywhere. You always think of these guys as completely French, completely Chinese, those theories never meet. It's not true. They were all informed by each other. And so a lot of that, my theoretical foundation is based on that confluence of Chineseness once again, because theory itself is also fluid. It is never like, well, oh, the, that's the French theory. No, I mean, Althusser was reading Mao. Mao was reading Marx, you know, I mean, and so, um, we come to this in, in our intellectual terms in ways that are really important to us. You know, we want to be Foucauldians, but Foucault was informed by Althusser, Althusser was informed by Mao. And so does that make a difference to us? Does it make any difference to us? I don't know, but just a bunch of nerds thinking that way. It's a good, it's a good sort of exploration, I guess. At the, at the end of his days, uh, Louis Althusser used to walk around the university in Paris after he killed his wife. He, he, used, he was by no means a yeah, good guy. He, no, he was, killed his wife. He, was, uh, he used to say, Je suis le grand uh, Louis Althusser. Je suis le, le grand Althusser. And I think he, uh, he was a very, a very great uh, philosopher. Yeah. And, and finally, that this is my... I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> when you say we are all doomed to become zombies, uh, yesterday I was reading about uh, Tony de Mello, and, and he says something very interesting, if you don't mind. Spirituality means waking up. Most people, even though they don't know it, are asleep. Yeah, they are born asleep. They live asleep. They marry and they're in their sleep. They breed children in their sleep. They die in their sleep without ever waking up. It's really sad. But we're, that's why we're in college. That's why we're here, so that we wake up and know things and explore things and talk about them. That's what college is for. And, and that's really where ideas can wake us up. You know, if it's just ideas, that's, that's all we need. That's all we need. That's exciting. That's an exciting idea. Questions from my students. What are you guys studying right now? So you, you went through uh, modern history, starting from the Qin? We made our way up to Xi Jinping. Okay. And this idea of, of Xi Jinping and the PRC today as sort of the, uh, <clears throat> the much more confident cultural gatekeepers of Chinese identity compared yeah. with Mao, who who obviously oversaw the, the attempted utter destruction of Chinese culture. Um, and then Deng Xiaoping was a sort of transitional figure. And then in the 90s, there's this, this growing confidence to now the sort of road to rejuvenation. Right. But um, interesting and interesting to have Ai Weiwei in there um, in the 90s, in this pivotal moment, and then into the, into the 2000s. And Ai Weiwei now, I think, situated in Germany after his 
his, his reckoning. He's in um, Lisbon, actually. Oh, he's in Lisbon. He's in Portugal. He's in Portugal. Okay. So see, after sort of the reckoning, first with the backpacks, of course, a 2008 earthquake, and then with his uh, with his detainment, right. or with his detention, and then leading to him him choosing to leave. And we had Perry Link come in and talk about the Ocean Boa. Um, and sort of taking these these real, sort of grand artistes, you know, figures, these these, these larger than life figures yeah. of Zhang Yimou, Mo, Ai Weiwei, Liu Xiaobo, and, and sort of using them as mm -hmm. uh, as placeholders. These guys have watched some of the films of Zhang Yimou, um, but but we've been. Um, I think it's it's really good context, and and hopefully this has given everybody a lot to think about. Yeah, I mean because you know it's it's that work is China, it's mainland China. Um, what is Hong Kong work? You know, what is Taiwan work? Then I, I really pose that question because um, it, are they Chinese artists then, or are we still into the heroicizing of what these experimental artists are doing in China, which is really quite brave, you know. When I went there in 2000, I was interviewing Ai Weiwei, and he was, um, you know, he was telling me that people got beat up and really couldn't express the way he wanted to express. Um, for that reason, though, because they were contesting what was going on in their country in terms of industrialization. So um, it, it is a, a real dilemma um, when you think about what the arts can do and what the arts represent. And so I'm just kind of opening it up for rethinking what constitutes Chinese art to me. And I know my old advisor at, Cal at UCSD, Paul Pickowitz, does a lot with underground and independent film um, as well, and sort of problematizing the line between those. And I did a project where I catal catal uh, cataloged about 200 underground Chinese films at UCSD. And so I watched them all and they were, cool. it was, yeah, the, the, your, your emphasis on performative art is yeah. definitely front and center in these, these underground films. So there was, that was quite an, quite an experience. Uh, hi, doctor. Um, so my question is, when we talked about Chinese-ness and, you know, blurring the borders, is there a fear within some of the subcultures within China of it, especially with what's happening to the Uyghurs happening to the rest by Chinese, and this will sort of form around the dominant culture while the dominant culture sort of smothers the lesser known cultures? That's exactly what's happening. You know, I mean, these, the Weezer community really feels at risk as the two, the Tibetan communities, right? Tibetan communities feel very little at risk. So, um, and then, you know, there's absolute silence. There's, it's still not very authoritarian government. So you really can't speak out. And um, when I um, presented this work and showed it to uh, Patty Chang, she was like saying, well, I'm, I'm really worried about these women too, because you never know what will happen to them. So it is a real danger in, the, in terms of the authoritarian um, nature of the government today. Yes, and, and so, you know, I mean, there is that nationalism that's still alive for real. China and you can't discount them. I'm I'm talking in idealistic terms, thinking about Chinese. -ness. So um, I wanna okay. so I wanna start with thanking you for this talk. Um, you know, I think we probably heard once of like, oh I hate contemporary art or what's the point of it. I feel like that's such a common thing, but um, I've grown to really like it over time because of when you learn the context of it, it's really politically heavy. And I personally love anything politically, like a political call out, whether it's music, art, or any of that. Um, and from the pieces that you shared, my favorite one was the Trekking the Plum Tree Steam Project. Is because another thing I really like is community, uh, how food is formed, what, what benefits we get out of creating communities. Um, seeing as how this was both performative, but also to give back to this community, was it used as a model for future projects to clean up in the area or in other parts of China where this specific project was um, referenced? Yes, yes. Um, this, the Plum Tree Creek project, was a culmination of a lot of different performances. Um, and so, 
Yes, she, you should check out her other work, um, Ulam Ali. She does, um, she did a, a river work where she brought people to the river and, and sh shared that community of river life. Um, a lot of artists are doing performances for this very reason, to bring people together. If, if you were to look at um, the last talk I gave a couple of weeks ago in Muckborough, I brought together a lot of different artists that use performance to bring communities together. And so just check out that video link in a moment. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, it, it really is uh, an exciting moment for performance artists, environmental performance, because um, it's a way to feel better. You know, because you have devastating situations after disaster. For instance, Ichi Akita um, in Japan after the Fukushima um, uh, nuclear disaster, people felt terrible back in 2011. And so what he did was bring 500 people together to clean up a really dirty, gross park in Tokyo just to feel better, just to feel better. because. We're more and more going to be these people that have to face disaster. And how do we do that? How do we come together around disaster? You know, we either have to be the walking dead or we find a more positive, hopeful way to um, maybe clean up a dirty park is what uh, Uchi Ikeda did. And so if you, you check out my, um, my video on YouTube, uh, where I gave this talk just a couple weeks ago in, in England, you know, I, I talk about that piece quite a bit. And um, a lot of it is inflected with other cultural, spiritual ideals too. Like um, Ichi Akita was very Buddhist in his, his uh, use of, of uh, symbols in the way that he brought, cleaned up the park, for instance. He created Dharma wheels and all sorts of really wonderful symbols to lift up the, the people. You know, like how do you how do you deal when you're 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 you went through a nuclear accident? Yeah. That was Fukushima. Awful. <laughs> um, and I think more and more we're going to find disaster scenarios for ourselves with environmental problems. What can we do? How do we come together? You know, these artists are asking that question. How do we come together? And I think they've been very effective. So um, I'm, I'm, that's my next book. It's compiling um, artistic performances that give us a sense of hope. You know, give us a sense of like we are a community. Let's just we come together and do something, anything, and feel better after disaster. Yeah. Hi, um, I, I just want to say how much I appreciated um, when you were going through um, talking about how um, the collectors, whoever collected them, is a person that's named after them. So I think it's not often talked about like provenance of certain objects um, and certain things that go greatly unnoticed when it shouldn't be. Um, and I know that there's a lot of work recently um, in museums and things like that, kind of recovered provenance of um, items and um, just returning of products. Of very important. Just, very important yeah. that things are returned and repatriated yes. to the communities that they belong to. Um, and that's what I wrote about, actually, that UCLA book, that uh, Global World Art and the Practice of the University Museum. It's university museums that have been um, championing, you know, people coming, bringing back works to the communities they belong to. Um, and, and yes, it's, it's you know, the, the uh, British Museum is, a, a, is in big trouble right now for all the things they've been doing. So um, we're very complicit. The museum world is very, very complicit in um, the kind of colonialist uh, conquests that you know art objects represent. Is like, oh well, we're collecting the whole world. It just, it's like a, it's like a, 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 a totem or a, 
a banner that says, oh, I conquered you, I'm taking your stuff, right? And, and so that is, work. museums are very complicit. Even our own museum, you know, our own museum on, on campus. I've had a lot of uh, arguments there because uh, we need to create different ways to represent cultures. And we need to move away from the old model where, you know, collecting is a form of conquest. It's, it's, we should, it should not be in the arts. It should not be in the arts. Get on my high horse on that. <laughs> I have a question about, and I bet this is an idea you can take about. I recently learned about this idea of elite capture and, and sort of the, the, the conversations of realms of high art or high film being sort of safely uh, squirreled away in the academy. Um, and I'm wondering if performance, and your emphasis on performance, is a way of making sure that doesn't happen. It's in your face. It's in the street. Yeah. You can't avoid it. It's a, it's a, it must be encountered. Yes. Um, is, that, is that one role of, of performance art? That is absolutely the role of performance. That's the reason why I'm writing about it now. I'm not very interested in the museum industrial complex where you have people just buying artworks and then reselling them for to Jeff Bezos, you know, I'm not really interested in that. I, I want to focus my energy on works that actually make a difference, you know? Um, and, and because as an art historian, that my energy goes there. I, I don't really want to belong to that uh, upper elite of gazillion dollar paintings, you know, um, which is a part of the problem, I think. It's part of the problem, the industrial environmental problems that we face. And, and um, moving towards environmentalism is really important to me because I think that um, if indeed you have children and grandchildren, you have to worry about it. You have to do, feel like you're part of the solution and not part of the problem as an art historian. Okay. So, so performance, yes. Uh, Performance has always been um, my focus. When I started uh, out as an art historian, I was looking at work by um, Zhang Huan and Ai Weiwei, and I had met those guys a long time ago. Um, and then I started to see that, well, it's a, a pretty masculine world, you know, this, the, the uh, artist in the experimental movement. Um, and so that's when I started to try to, you know, not that I'm being biased at all, but to sort of, you know, find those women artists too, because they're there. You just, they just don't seem to be talked about a lot. So, um, and I, I spent a lot of time looking at feminist works um, in China as well. Um, but performance has a long legacy. And when I, um, wrote about a performance piece recently, and you can see it in my, my uh, talk in Loughborough. Um, there's artists that use performance from um, opera as well, from Chinese opera. So they combine that conceptualism in um, Western conceptualism for performance with Chinese opera. So it's really amazing work. You know? I mean, it draws in all those signifiers and different vocabularies for understanding what they're doing in terms of performance. And that's why I love about it. It is a visual medium. It's not simply theater or dance. It is about a conceptualism so that when you see the work, you actually experience it yourself. It involves you. You're a part of the performance. It requires you to be there. It's temporally bound. It's about time and space and place. And um, that's what I love about it. Yeah. Hi. Um, so you mentioned the masculine, kind of masculine world of um, art. And I was wondering if, how are these um, artists reckoning with the idea of maybe femininity and womanhood or womanhood? Um, in an artistic space and the idea of kind of a fluid uh, Chinese identity. 
Um, is there any examples of that coming together, femininity, womanhood, and Chineseness? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you can go back to this cover, I mean, this is this is Lam Po Po. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a matriarch she's talking about. You know, um, it's it's a, a a woman artist taking a woman subject and making her the focus of the lens. So that in that video work, you are really looking at a woman figure who's hardly ever the central subject of most art. Let's face it. You know, when was your grandma ever the focus of a work of art, right? And so it is definitely a feminist move to do that. Um, and and uh, uh, so uh, if, if you were to read that part of my book, you'll see that um, what I'm trying to do is to elevate these people, these, these subjects, these narratives, because they're there. I mean, Wu Ma Li spent like a good five years filming women who sewed for a living. You know? um, and uh, she took their narratives and then sewed them onto a screen so that you really get the sense of what these women do. You know, they're, they're sewing as their life. Uh, but, but, but at the same time, celebrate them. Say, you know, sewing is great. It's not a bad thing to spend your life doing that. You know? Whereas, you know, ordinary labor is often thought of as, you know, oh, why don't you get a real job? Oh, that's the lowest thing. And, and to understand the world through uh, the, the vision of someone like Yaking Tan is, is to say that, you know, what women do matters. What women do really is important to our our lives, and uh, it's it's not often seen that way in most of the world. Definitely not the way I was brought up either. Very patriarchal society. Thank you. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. We want to move toward wrapping up now because we've, we've asked Professor Jim Davidson for oh for, I've gone way over an entire afternoon. No, no, not, well, I think the discussion has kept us going. Please join me in thanking Professor Jim Davidson. Thank Thanks you very much. An applause, virtual applause from our friends online. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and. Um, uh, it's not more important, but they have to go.